Yes. Okay, so today in Python we are going to be going over plotting. See, today I already uh, synced and then use git bash to pull in the update. There's a new repo and a couple of files, that, or a new uh, notebook and a couple of files to go with it. So I'll go ahead and start the Jupyter notebook. Okay, so today we're doing uh, plotting, and you could plot just about anything in Python. Um, occasionally I come across something that I can't do in plotting in Python, such as the pairs plot that you could do in ggplot very easily. Um, well, when I say you can't do that, I mean it's it doesn't look as nice, and it's not nearly as simple. You sort of have to build your own function to do it. Then one very useful thing is there's a link here that has a large number of examples and code for all of them, and they cover pretty much everything you could do with the plotting, starting with basic stuff, and then getting to more advanced things. Here are some statistical things. Eventually they get into sort of maps, pie charts, and then eventually some 3D plotting. I'll try to touch as many areas as I can for basics of plotting, but I won't get into things like 3D plotting. Those will be for you to look up on your own. So yeah, it's very long. There's, then if you click on one of these, go up to it, it'll have all the uh, code right here that was used to create this plot including the packages that you used and things like that. So let's start by importing all the packages you need. Uh, for all your notebooks, you should probably make a habit of doing this at the beginning, just make sure you have them when you need them. And also, if someone else is looking at your code, it's nice for them to be able to see what you are going to be using right at the start. So the first thing is uh, matplotlib is the plotting package for Python. Well, and pyplot is a sub package that we use for almost everything. And then we're going to be using numpy to create uh, the data that we'll, we will be plotting. This is the uh, all the stuff we went over yesterday. And uh, this command is an ipython command that pretty much just makes your uh, plots show up. Alternatively, you could do uh, the show command um, after every single plot, which 
which is uh, what they do in the examples, I believe. But that's inconvenient if you're doing a lot of plots like we are here. So I'll go ahead and run that. So and then we'll start off with um, some basic plotting. Uh, so if you want to do something simple in Python, the command is usually also very simple. So first we'll make the data here. Remember the lens space command. Uh, we're going, we're making a bunch of x values between negative two and two, and there's going to be a hundred points in that range, evenly spaced. Then our y is just going to be x squared. Then to plot this, just plot command and then x comma y. And there you go. And you'll notice that there's a line of output here. That's because we didn't set it equal to anything. Um, you don't have to most of the time. Uh, but if you don't want that line, one way to get rid of it is assign it to a class attribute. Another way is to add a semicolon on your last line of output in the cell. And that will just uh, suppress any output. And you might also know that this should be a discrete number of points, and so should y. But instead, it's plotting a line here. And that's just because of the default for the plot function. So let's take a look at what the plot function does. And then there's a whole bunch of things. And then if you scroll down, there's a list of different uh, styles you can use for your points and lines. And those are indicated by a character that you just pass to it after your um, after you tell it what to plot. So I made a little table here of the basic ones. It's pretty much just uh, whatever you want to use. Look at your keyboard and pick the thing that looks most like it. So point is a period, a line is a dash, a dash line is two dashes, circle is an O, and dot dash, and so on. And then if you also want to specify the color, you would just prefix that with um, a letter that corresponds to the color. Black is K, blue is the B. And uh, you could also, in the examples I did it in the same string here, but you could also def explicitly define the color separately if that gets too confusing, like uh, it's down here. And then another option if you just want to see the points is you could use scatter to make a scatter plot. It's slightly different than plot. Um, you can't switch the lines as easily if you're doing using the scatter function. And also um, plot takes arrays as input. You could also uh, use lists as input and it'll automatically convert them to arrays. So here we have an R dot so this should be uh, red, and it'll come up as points. And it's the uh, same data we were using earlier. So, and then this is G, and then dash dash. So it's a dashed line, and then the line width is some is a parameter you can pass if uh, you're using something that's line related. If you're using dots or points of some sort, it doesn't really make sense to change the line width. Uh, one is the default, it's a pretty thin line as we saw in here. So two is probably twice as wide or something like that. You can see it's a little easier to see. And then it's nice to have uh, one plot for each cell. Uh, We'll go over subplots later, but it's pretty much every time you do a new plot command in a cell, it all plots, everything is added to the same plot here. So we're now I'm doing another lens space command, so it's between 0 and 2.5, and there's 12 points there. So if you want to plot multiple things here, you could uh, just do multiple plot commands. You could also do it on the same line like this. Um, it will give you the same results. 
Well, here I put a dash so it's uh, points and the uh, line connecting them. Here I did not. That's the only real difference. It's the same thing. It's just this is all on one line. I wouldn't recommend doing that because suppose you didn't want to see x squared. You just wanted to compare x and x cubed. Then you could just comment out this line and then run it and it disappears and it's easy to put it back just by getting rid of the comment. So that's why it's nice to have one command per line. And obviously you want to do more than just plot points and lines. So there's a whole bunch of different options we could do. So we're going to explore a bunch of these at once. They pretty much all use their own functions. And there's a large volume of these functions. So I'm just going to show you the basic ones. And then if you want to explore them, see what other options they have. Remember, you could just uh, type the name of the function and then a question mark after it, and it'll show you the documentation. Another way, if you don't know how to do something, you could go to um, Matplotlib gallery that I showed you, and then look for something that looks like what you want to do, and then click on it and look at that code, or you could just Google it. Those are three ways of figuring out how to do what you want, just in case I don't mention it here. So the first thing we're going to do is um, add a specific size to our plot. That's uh, what this is doing here, the fig size for the figure function. The figure function there's a lot of other things we can pass to it. Right now I'm just defining the figure size. So this is a little bit bigger than the defaults. I, I don't know what the default is. It's probably like something like 6, 4. This is in inches. Um, there's also other things you could... I'm pretty sure there's ways you could pass in centimeters or pixels or whatever. So we could look at that function, and yeah, see this is in inches. There's also DPI, which is resolution. Um, you can change the color, so the background color of the plot and the border color. So the background you can see in these plots is white, and the border is black, which usually works pretty well. So there's all sorts of defaults you can change. Next thing we're going to change here is the X and Y labels. So that's just the X label here. And then you type the string of whatever label you want it to be. And then this is optional. If you can change the font size. This doesn't actually do much. And in a little while, we'll, I'll show you how to uh, change the size of all of the text. And this is just in case you want the uh, labels different sizes from the other text, such as the title, or a legend, or uh, annotations, or things like that. And then we'll also have a title. So we get the X label for the X axis, Y label, and here's the title. Uh, pretty much the same thing as labels, except a different name for the function. And then we'll also add a legend. So with each plot command, you'll see something new. That's the label. Um, the dollar signs are so it uh, renders in leg tech. So it just makes it look nicer. The leg tech isn't required. It's just uh, nice for equations and special characters, to, like uh, Greek letters. You could do those in leg tech. And then you, the legend is here. This is where it creates the legend. This is just a label for each one. They don't show up unless you make the legend. So uh, lock is just location. And I'm just telling it to find the best location. There's also numbers that correspond to each of the corners and the sides. I don't know those off the top of my head, but those are easy to look up. And then I'll also have minor ticks. In default plot, there's just these uh, big ticks. So there will be sub ticks here. And then um, someone asked for R, how do you make a log scale? So I'm also going to show that. It's pretty easy. Um, just Y scale, then log. There's other scales you could do. I'm not sure 
would ever really use most of them for the various options available. And then I also added a grid here. So that's, uh, you need to set grid equal to true, so that turns it on. And then uh, this one does it for the uh, major ticks. And then it'll have, uh, this is the line width. It'll be a dotted line by default, so you can also change that. It's probably called line type or something. And then uh, another command does it for the minor ticks. It's already set to true, so I don't need to do that again. And then the line width is a uh, quarter, so it's not too crowded. So we could go ahead and plot this. And you can see it's going to look much nicer. Here's the log scale. There's a legend up here. And then these equations look nice because they're in uh, LaTeX. And then mm -hmm. we got our X label, Y label, <coughs> and a title. And you can see the grid, which looks a little funny because the Y axis is a log scale. And then the uh, next thing I'm going to show you is how to change the limits. So, say we want to go from we want to expand it or shrink the size of our plot. We could change the limits of the plot. So a good example of this is, well, let me just uh, remove the limits for a second and show you what this looks like without it. So uh, we're using the lens space from NumPy again to create our data. Mm -hmm. So it's just a whole bunch of values from 0 to uh, 2 pi, 100 of them. Then we're also plotting uh, sine and cosine same plot. So let's look at this. Bunch of points, we get some red dots for cosine and some blue triangles for sine. But you might notice, well, it ends at 7 instead of 2 pi, and it's sort of crowding the top of your data, and uh, there's not really enough room for the legend. So why don't we make the uh, x limits go from 0 to 2 pi? And then the y limits go from, just give it 10% more room on each side, so negative 1.1 to 1.1. And you can see the data a little better and it looks nicer. Alternatively, if you want to sort of generalize this, you can take the minimum for that value and just multiply it by uh, uh, 1.1, and that'll be the lower limit max for one moment. And that'll make sure that all of your data is always on the screen, or always on the uh, plot. Mm -hmm. And the ticks could also be explicitly labeled. So here it's integers, that might, which is the default, which might not be the best for whatever you want to do. Say we're uh, doing sine and cosine of the unit is in radians, so why don't we do this in units of pi? And while we're at it, I'm also going to make the font size bigger. Um, notice that this change is not specific to this plot. This will carry through, through to all of the cells that follow whenever I run this. And then I'm going to make the figure a little bit bigger too. Uh, Pretty much the same thing, except when I get to X ticks, I pass in two lists. The first list is um, the locations of the ticks. The second list is um, what I want their labels to be. And remember, it not only takes lists, it also takes arrays. And remember, um, in the past couple days, we found some easy ways to define lists and arrays. Uh, this is also lead tech. Uh, forget why the R is there, and I think it's because it doesn't render properly if you try to do LaTeX and JX unless you put the R before each of the strings. So let's run this. You see it's nice and big. The font's bigger too. Uh, <coughs> changing the font did not change the size of the plot. I did that separately. So now it's confused. And you can see the X ticks here are now nice convenient units. And then just like in uh, ggplot, there's an alpha parameter for transparency. So you could just add that at the end of your uh, plot. Um, you could also do filling areas or, well, 
roughly you could add torque to just about anything that you put on your plot. You could do change the transparency of lines, points, but we could also fill under the curve or something like that. So that's what I'm going to use it for in the next example. And I'm also going to add a horizontal line right here. Um, yes, you could do this by just uh, plotting something for y equals zero, but this is a more robust way to do it. And it uses the axis objects. And this is how you define it. We'll go over the subplot command later. So it's mostly the same. I changed uh, these to lines. So it makes more sense to fill under them. I made them pretty thick by changing the line width here. Uh, here's the filling under the curve. Well, it's not necessarily under, it's between uh, it's for x and y, and it's the color for this fill is red, which corresponds to this curve. It could make it a different color than the curve if I wanted to. And then here's the transparency. Uh, one is the default, which will make it opaque. And overlapping sort of just adds um, what the alpha is. But these are different colors. Same thing with the X sticks, and then this is the horizontal line. I uh, give it a Y value, and then the start and the stop. Vertical line is similar. So let's look at this, and it should look pretty nice. You can see where it overlaps, it just sort of merges them. Whereas if it was, uh, if I didn't change the transparency, one of them would just completely cover up the other. You wouldn't be able to see it as well. You can see the horizontal line here. Default is black, and you could also change the width and the color of the line. And yeah, as I mentioned earlier, it's starting to take a number of lines here. It's nice that these are all grouped in different cells in uh, the notebook, so it's nice and convenient to organize yourself by putting one the, all the code for one plot in each cell. And you, if I decide I don't want the fill or the line, it's easy to comment it out. And that way it doesn't permanently get rid of it, and I can go back and remove the comment symbol anytime I want to bring it back. So now we'll move on to some different types of plots. We're going to start with a simple bar chart, which you would use for maybe plotting a categorical data. So we're just going to use some simple categories, just letters A through F. And then we need uh, positions on the x-axis for uh, each of these categories. We're just going to use integers using A range. Then the values for uh, the heights of these bars uh, that's whatever your data is for these categories. Here I'm just going to use uh, random numbers. And then this uh, function will just give me random numbers for the number of uh, categories I have here. Then the function is bar, pretty simple. Use the x positions, the uh, y values. And I like uh, it to center on each of the categories instead of being I think the default is to the left, which doesn't really look as good. Then I'm going to make it not completely opaque, just because I feel like that looks a little better. You could also change the colors here if you want. And then uh, for the x ticks, I'm getting, I have a list for the positions already, and I have a list for the categories already. So these are really easy to label because, the, well, I have an array for the uh, positions, which works just as well. Then I've got the labels here in the title. So we'll look at this. And it's a nice bar chart. You could also do um, a more horizontal one. I think uh, the function is just h bar or something, or bar h, pretty similar. And then, as you uh, saw and might have seen in the gallery, there's a whole bunch of statistical plots you could do. Uh, I'm not going to show you these if you want to use them. You can go ahead, feel free to look up. 
I'm just going to show the most basic one for the sake of time, which is the histogram. It's what most people use whenever, well, it's the most mm -hmm. generic thing. So first I'm going to create the data. We'll have a mean of about 1,000, standard deviation of 100. So uh, this data I'm going to, it's also random numbers. But these are with the normal distribution. That's what the little n is there for. So multiply that by sigma, add it to the mean, and that'll give me a nice distribution. And then the number of bins is the number of uh, sort of like the columns in your histogram. Um, forget what the default is, but uh, his command is pretty simple. Just the data, so all of your numbers and the bins, which is just the integer number of comments here in the title I use LaTeX again. This is how you get a Greek. You just do the backslash and then the, uh, the word that corresponds to that letter. So I have mu for, for mean and sigma for the standard deviation. And x and y labels. So it comes out looking pretty nice. And as you can see the data is normally distributed. This will change every time because this frame function is well, random. Uh, some of you might be working with images. There's more tools for them. I'm just going to show how you plot an image. Um, so let's just display some of those. Uh, it's using the function imshow. And when you uh, read the image, well, in this case, I'm going to use this uh, package to read the image. It reads it into an array. And it's uh, three dimensions. So you think a picture is two dimensions. You got horizontal, vertical, but the third dimension is the color. So you got one of those for each color. So there's an intensity for red, blue, and green is probably the typical. So this is the file name. You could also specify a path in this here. The file is in the same directory, so I don't really need to do that. This will plot the figure. It's there's a lot of things that are similar. Like I could um, add a title. I could change the size of it. And here's the plot command. And uh, it comes with an axis. But if you think about it, you don't want every picture or image to have an axis for the units of the pixels. So Tipsy is uh, one of my bunnies. So here's Tipsy. And then because it's an array, it's very easy to manipulate. So if I just want to mirror this image, that's something we learned uh, yesterday is how to flip arrays around. So first one is the rows, I think, and this one's the columns. So the third value is just a, is a negative one. It's just going to reverse the order of the columns. And the last one's the colors. So you probably don't want to mess with those. See, it's reverse. And this is the axis that appears by default. Here I set it to uh, off because it looks nicer in most cases. Now we'll use this uh, picture of the other one. This is my other bunny. This is Rambo. And then there's a lot of. Suppose we didn't have a three dimensional, it was just um, two dimensional. So there's not necessarily colors, just a two-dimensional array. You could plot any array. Sometimes they make it, they're useful for making nice heat maps. So here we'll do zero, which is just the, remember that's the first index for a color. So it's all of the x and y values, but uh, just one of the colors. And then we'll look at this. Here is the shape. Uh, before we, I, yeah, forgot to mention uh, dot shape is one of the instance attributes that you can use on arrays. I'll just tell you the shape of the array. So the one before was three mm -hmm. dimensions. And then the one down here is now <laughs> two dimensions. And you'll notice, wait, it's still in color. Why is that? And that's because uh, this is the default color map for two-dimensional images. And 
So uh, you can change the color map if you want. There's a whole bunch of things you can do with Inshow. It um, might be as complicated or more complicated than plot as far as the number of options you have. So let's go ahead and change the uh, color map. So this is hot, so hot colors are red, orange, yellow. Then we could also add something useful like a color bar, which will show you the level of the intensities. Now, I don't actually know which, uh, what this corresponds to, the first color and the uh, array. It might be red, blue, or green, so this doesn't necessarily mean this is the level of red in the plot. But you can see these are the intensities, and if it was all three colors, it would just stack them on top and you get a nice looking image. And then you could also do statistics pretty easily because they're arrays, so it's really um, pretty simple to get statistics out of that. So let's go ahead and make a histogram of all the intensities here. And we'll take the uh, array for this one color. Uh, the Ravel instance attribute you can use on any array, and what it does is it pretty much just converts it to one dimension, which sometimes makes sense and sometimes it does not make sense, so be careful when you use this. What it does is, in this case, it's a two-dimensional array, so it takes the first row and just concatenates every single row onto the end of that one and just adds them together. There's uh, other ways to do this. There's also something called reshape or something similar like that, which does the opposite. And you could specify the shape that you want your one-dimensional array to become. That's uh, also an easy way to make arrays that I didn't go over last time. So I'm going to use 256 bins. That's because we have uh, 8 bits per pixel, so the intensity values go between 0 and 256. And the range will be the same. And uh, don't worry about this for now. And then I'm going to change the limits so it doesn't go to 300, which is probably the default. You can see it's a nice histogram of all the uh, pixel values, one bin for each uh, integer value. And this picture is pretty wide range. It's not like they're all clumped together. So it's a cool thing to look at. There's lots of pixels in there. Another thing you might want to do is plot more than one thing at once. Um, I mentioned that I would go over the subplot function. So what the subplot function does is the first two are, that's sort of the shape of the number of plots. So the first two numbers are the number of rows and then the number of columns. And the third one is uh, which one you're going to plot on at the moment. And beneath it, what you do is just the same stuff you do with everything else. And then when you want to go to the next one, you specify it. Same thing, except number two for the second plot. Or second plot and uh, it goes up to whatever your rows times your number of columns is. It goes left to right, top to bottom. So it's pretty intuitive. So number of rows, number of columns, and plot number. Um, earlier you saw you define the axis by a subplot 111. What that is is the default is 111. If these are all integers that are less than 10, you don't actually need the commas, which is pretty cool. So this one I could actually just do 326 and it would be the same. I just left it like this so it's easier to learn the first time looking through. So these are just a bunch of the uh, previous plots from this notebook, and I'm going to put them mm -hmm. together. And everything else is done pretty much the same way it usually is, except something like changing the size of the figure applies to the entire object. Here I'm going to make it pretty big, because there's a large number of plots. And this will probably take as much time as plotting each one of these. And here we go. So we got nice plots side by side. If you make it too small, like if I didn't change the uh, 
bigger size, you would have problems because all the labels would be overlapping and the uh, uh, legends would be overlapping the data. So you want to make sure it's nice and large. And here they all take up about the same amount of space. Suppose you want a plot that's like twice as uh, wide as uh, any of the others. You could, uh, so let's do that real quick. To do that, we'll just plot five at a time, so we'll get rid of one mm -hmm. of these by commenting it out. Then, say I want this to be twice as wide, so I want it to take up the entire second row. So three is the first one for the first row, but I also want it to take up four, so I just put in a three count four, so it's a little tuple object in here. And then if we run it now, It'll take up the uh, whole row here. So it's not terribly difficult to do. Uh, this is how you would make the Paris plot that I mentioned earlier. It just doesn't look as nice, and you would have to probably write your own function for it or look something up. So it's not as easy as just uh, the one line of code in R. Everything else is pretty similar as far as the capabilities between Python and R. Python might be able to do more. I don't know all that much about R plotting. This is what I use like whenever I have a project for or an assignment class and it involves plotting something. Uh, I just go to Python. Especially if there's a lot of data for it and that, that I need to plot that data, it's really easy to do. And then the last thing I'll show for today is how you uh, save plots. And this is really easy. Um, at the end, you just, well, first you need to define it as a figure. So when, if you're defining the figure size, that's pretty easy. Remember that the figure function also does a bunch of other things. You mm -hmm. just need to set it equal to uh, uh, whatever you want to call it. And then Save, saving the figure is an instance attribute, so you just do dot save fig, and then whatever you want to name. So if I do this, this is the plot that I'm saving, it's just one of the ones from earlier. And if I look in the uh, directory, you can see it's right there. So I created that file. Are there any questions about plotting? Mm -hmm. All right, and that's uh, what I have for today. Uh, next week we will do a bunch of other topics, mostly more advanced stuff. I wanted to get plotting out of the way because it's useful for um, mm -hmm. showing how other tools work. On Monday we'll do SciPy. So uh, Tuesday. Or, yeah, Tuesday. <laughs> We'll do uh, SciPy, which is stuff like interpolation, modeling, um, integrals, derivatives, all sorts of things. And I'll also do FFTs, which are from NumPy. And then after that, uh, Mohammed will take over, and he's going to show you a few other things, such as uh, Pandas, which is the equivalent of data frames in R. It's just a package for handling those. They'll also show um, Scikit Learn for machine learning. Yeah, and Scikit, and Scikit Image for image processing. And then there's also ways that you can run um, Python code in R, and I'll show you that. Mm -hmm. And the week after will be uh, LaTeX and Markdown. Yeah. So if you don't understand some of the Markdown stuff I'm using, or the LaTeX I'm using for um, labels, it's also very useful to make good looking equations in these notebooks. Mm -hmm. That will be covered as a, another topic. Okay, thanks. Cool.